Well, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Roger Royce, I'm the founder of the Royce Law Firm, and offices in Northern and Southern California, including right across the street here in Palo Alto. And today's discussion is going to be on the topic of what can we do about gun violence. And what I thought we would do is we've got three panelists here representing three different views on gun control. And we'll give everybody an opportunity here to sort of present who they are, what their position is, and uh, what their answer to that question is. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and ask a series of questions, and I'll give each of the panelists an opportunity to respond. Uh, in the meantime, I thought I'd sort of set the stage a little bit and give you a little bit of a summary of where the law is uh, uh, these days on Second Amendment uh, and gun control. But before we do that, um, I'm going to share with you an anecdote of how this topic sort of came to the front of my mind in any event. It was a couple of months ago, I happened to be up in San Francisco in the South of the Market area, and I parked my car in this uh, monitored parking lot, Wells Fargo parking lot on Brandon and Forth, where I always park my car when I go up there because it's monitored and I feel safe. And as I was leaving, I was getting into my car and I was taking my jacket off, and I noticed this odd thing. I noticed some people running across the street down Brandon towards me in the parking lot. And they got a little close to me and I said, what's going on? Because they weren't wearing jogging outfits. And they said, well, don't you hear those gunshots? And right about then, I heard this barrage of gunshots. And then I saw a flurry of people coming up Brandon Street. It turned out that I had inadvertently stumbled into the worst nightclub shooting in San Francisco in about a year, which was right across the street. It started in a club, spilled out on the Brandon, and ended in the parking lot next to where I was. Now at that point, two things went through my mind. The first one is, why do people have guns, you know, on Brandon Street in San Francisco? The second thought is, why don't I have one? I'm totally defenseless here. And then I left. But since then, my thinking has evolved into a bigger question, is that what can we do about gun violence? Now, the Second Amendment states that the right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. In 1939, the Supreme Court had ruled that the Second Amendment protects uh, arms that have a reasonable relationship to the preservation of a well-regulated militia. And that decision really created a lot of confusion and debate as to what we mean by militia. Is that individuals? Is that state? Some of the part of the theory was that the Second Amendment was really designed to protect the states from the federal government. That they should have state militias uh, to protect them from the federal militia. That decision or that question was put to rest in 2008 in the Heller case, District of Columbia versus Heller, when the Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment protects individual rights to possess guns. Now, there were three really significant things that came out of Heller, I think. So, number one is the idea that it is an individual right, and not a right of a state, or not a right of an organized militia, or a national guard, or something like that. Secondly, there's language in that decision that basically provides for reasonable restrictions, that provides the federal government or the states to impose reasonable restrictions on gun ownership. And thirdly, the decision was limited to commonly used guns uh, that premised on private use or self-defense, meaning hunting or self-defense. And in particular, the decision ruled that hand guns are ours for purposes of the Second Amendment. Now, as you probably know, uh, in 1994, the Feinstein bill became law, and a 10 year life had sunsetted in 2004. It banned uh, the use of assault weapons, whatever that means, uh, but that was not renewed. And just last week, as you probably know, uh, the Senate bill uh, did not pass that would have uh, imposed some additional restrictions on arms. In particular, the things that failed to pass were the idea of mandatory background checks, in particular at, at gun shows. Uh, but not for private individuals. Uh, a renewed and strengthened ban on assault weapons did not pass. A ban on high capacity magazines. There was a provision to limit magazine sizes to 10 rounds that did not pass. Uh, there was a provision to make straw purchasing and trafficking a federal crime did not pass. Finally, state reciprocity for carrying concealed weapons because some states have uh, concealed carry laws. That did not pass. So that's where we are. So I want to turn this over to our panelists, and let me make a quick introduction. 
First on my media right is Kylie Joy Gray. She's a blogger and a California native, um, and um, has also uh, been very active in politics, starting it now with her father's been for city council in Santa Barbara. Graduate of UC Santa Cruz at Women's Studies, she was the associate editor of the Daily Cause. Um, and you have, she now writes at Wonkette, um, and you have probably, uh, you may be familiar with her recent, very, very extremely popular blog post on why liberals should love the Second Amendment. I made the mistake of trying to print it out with all its comments. <laughs> I almost burned out my printer. <laughs> Dale Edmondson um, is a Palo Alto lawyer. He's a director of the Palo Alto Area Bar and a graduate of Stanford and Bolt. He represents technology companies and he's a policy advocate for the tech agenda on state and national issues. Okay, thanks for being here, Dale. Dale is going to represent, I guess, the modern centrist approach. And finally, Laura uh, Kudaleta uh, is a senior staff attorney at the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. She oversees the Law Center's work analyzing state firearms legislation and provides analysis and drafting expertise to public officials on regulatory solutions to gun violence. She was legal director for Contra Costa's legal, Contra Costa County's legal services uh, provider for domestic abuse and staff attorney for Legal Assistance Foundation of Metropolitan Chicago. So Kylie, I think we're going to start with you. And as I said, maybe before we get into the main question of what we can do about gun violence, I'd like to give each of you maybe five minutes to introduce yourselves and give us a broad general view of where you stand on the issue. All right. Well, uh, first off, I'm a proud liberal. I was a super volunteer for the Obama campaign in 2008. I believe we should socialize health care in this country. I believe all education should be free. I support free abortion on demand at any stage of pregnancy. I want marijuana legalized. I want to end the death penalty. So I'm not what you probably imagine when you think of somebody who supports the Second Amendment. Um, but I am a liberal who loves the Second Amendment. And the way that I approach it is the way I approach the entire Bill of Rights. They're individual rights that should be vigilantly regarded and expanded as much as possible for everybody. So although no right is absolute, you can't shout fire in a crowd, you can't threaten the life of the president, you can't publish somebody else's words as your own, we have plenty of restrictions on all of our rights. Like most people who support the Second Amendment, I do support some reasonable restrictions. The issue is what's considered reasonable and what works. Because I think we all share the same goal of wanting to reduce gun violence and gun deaths. But the question is how we achieve that. So, for example, if you look at Chicago and Washington, D.C., which in the past have had total bans on handguns, and have also been some of the worst cities in the country for um, gun violence with handguns that have been banned, you can see that some of those restrictions don't really work and aren't effective. And I believe that we should have laws and restrictions that are effective. So um, background checks, which is in the news currently, is a great example of something that I think would work, is very popular, could be very effective. The majority of the country supports it. Even the majority of NRA members support it. All of the polling has shown that even gun owners, even people who are very staunch advocates of the Second Amendment support background checks. Um, I think that mandatory safety courses make a lot of sense. I think that it would avoid a lot of the really tragic stories we hear about with accidental gun deaths, where a child finds his father's gun that is not safely secured and shoots himself or shoots somebody else. And I think that mandatory courses to teach people how to safely handle and store guns would go a long way toward reducing those deaths. So I'm a fervent supporter of the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment. I do want to see a reduction in gun deaths in this country. I think that the only issue is how we go about that and which laws and proposals are going to work and which ones aren't. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Laura? Okay. Um, so as you mentioned, I work at the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, and we're a national nonprofit, and we're dedicated to using laws and policies to reduce the immense loss of life due to gun violence in this country. We were formed in 1993 in the wake of a terrible shooting on one of our California Street in San Francisco. We exist now, two decades later, because we believe that we all have the right to live in communities free from the fear and threat of gun violence. Um, we also believe that we can protect everyone's Second Amendment rights 
and enact smart gun laws that will reduce death and injury from firearms. The United States experiences epidemic levels of gun violence. Gun violence. We, it needlessly claims over 30,000 lives annually. And for every person who dies, two more are wounded. It touches every segment of our society. It increases the probabil probability of deaths in incidents of domestic violence raises the likelihood of fatalities by those who intend to injure, injure others or themselves. And it places children at special risk. And it disproportionately, disproportionately affects communities of color. Mass shooting tragedies like the massacre in Newtown, Connecticut receive significant media attention. However, gun deaths and injuries in the U.S. occur quietly without national press coverage every single day. And it doesn't have to be this way. Americans own far more civilian firearms than people in other industrialized nations. And the United States gun laws are among the most lax in the world. America has 5% of the world's population and 50% of the world's guns. Therefore, it's no surprise that among 36 high-income and upper-middle-income countries, we have the highest overall gun mortality rate. Among children under 15, our firearm death rate is nearly 12 times higher than that among children in 25 other industrialized nations in the As Kylie said, the American public supports common-sense gun laws, and that's what makes this so unforgivable. We know how to stop this epidemic. The American people want to stop this epidemic. But as we saw last week in the Senate, we are not getting it done. While the gun industry breaks in profits by filling our streets with civilian versions of combat weapons, our children continue to die, and our Congress does nothing. Fortunately, the states are stepping in to do what the federal government can't or won't do. California has enacted some of the strongest gun laws in the country, and the legislature is currently considering over 40 new um, gun violence prevention measures as we speak. Other states are following our lead. It is our sincere hope that this momentum will continue and will eventually secure for every American the fundamental right to be safe in one's own home and neighborhood and live free from the constant threat of gun violence. Yeah, thank you. Dale, words? Well, uh, to some extent my task here is easier than I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> My, uh, I speak for no one other than myself at this point. I don't want to blame any other organization for my opinions here, but I, I view myself as someone that believes that there are certain reasonable um, data points that we should all be working for from as we try to work through what is a fairly complicated problem. Um, in the press, not all of the voices, in fact, not many of the voices are as reasonable as we've heard here today. Um, there are extremists on all sides that make arguments that to some extent clutter things up. And here it seems like we may not have as many issues there. Um, I, I think what I, would, what I would propose to do is kind of start off by laying down what I see as some very difficult to argue with basic facts that both sides have right and use those as sort of the, the uh, stepping stones from which we can attack this problem. Um, one, is the, one of those is that it's clear that gun violence is a complex problem. It can't be traced to a single thing. It isn't merely the availability of guns that has, some, that has to do with all the gun violence we have here. We certainly see that there's a lot of guns in Canada and there aren't death rates at the same level that there are here. Um, things such as mental health, an economic underclass, a lack, of, uh, a lack of support or options for people that are in desperate straits, all of these have much to do with gun violence. And I hope that's something that most of us in the country can agree on, that this, is, that this isn't something we can tackle in one dimension. Um, at the same time, I would think it's also fairly evident that, of course, prevalence of guns has something to do with level of gun violence. Most of the other industrialized countries in the world do not have the same level of gun availability that we do. They have far lower rates of gun death, even though they do not, in most cases, have lower levels of violence overall. Um, and I think. It, it's somewhat intuitively obvious, as well as borne out by the statistics, that having a gun all over the place, having it easy to get, has something to do with why we have these shootings and so forth. Um, so I think that that's something we should acknowledge as well. Um, I think the key issue is trying to figure out what common sense restrictions we really need. It sounds like nobody here, and not that many in the blogosphere, would argue that everybody has an individual right to own a tank or a nuke. 
Um, it seems also like the number of people that would argue that people don't have a right to own any weapon whatsoever is also comparatively low, although we do hear voices from that point uh, going around the water sphere as well. Um, the focus is where are we going to get regulations that are actually going to keep guns out of the hands of bad guys in responsible hands, um, available but hopefully not prevalent. Um, I, I find I have great difficulty with the NRA notion that, that the solution to the Sandy Hooks of the world is to make sure there are more guns in schools rather than less. Um, but I do also have difficulty with the notion that regulation alone is going to solve the problem. Um, like it or not, we are in a society where there are guns everywhere. Simply outlawing them tomorrow would not make them disappear. Um, they, would, they would still leave them in the hands mostly of dishonest citizens, Take it, make it hard for honest citizens to get them. And finding a way to thread that needle is really, to a large degree, what our task is, I think. Um, I find things like gun safety something that we should really be focusing on. As, as someone who took a gun safety class a year ago, um, to me, it's remarkable how many people who actually know what they're doing still manage to hurt themselves with these things. Um, I'm sitting here as a person who routinely has a shampoo bottle hit, my, hit me on the head right after I put it up there, and yet I seem to be better trained in safety than a lot of people who can get guns, and that to me seems madness, and yet it seems like there still is resistance to things that, um, that would require somebody before they exercise a right to be able to exercise it responsibly. And it seems to me that should be part of the conversation too, is that um, assuming that one has an individual right, and the Supreme Court has made it clear that we do to have a weapon, does not one also have a responsibility to those in the community around them to be able to use it safely? Um, is, it, is anyone really going to make the, make the argument that you have a right to buy a combat weapon via mail or bring it into your neighborhood and shoot it through the wall and hurt your neighbor's kids because you didn't know what you were doing? Somewhat. But that seems to me to be one of the kinds of things we should look at, given that I believe, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, there are more accidental gun deaths than there are deaths in home defense and so forth. Um, I think it's also fair to ask the question, whenever we come up with a new regulation, is this a reasonable burden on our rights that gives us a benefit that's commensurate with that burden? We ask the question of, is outlawing an assault weapon that is somewhat arbitrarily defined, is that going to make us more safe or less safe? and at what costs in terms of our rights. Um, the answers to those questions aren't always easy. In some cases, I think they're easier than others. It sounds like we all are somewhat speaking with one voice on the background check issue, although I think there are, there are arguments that can be made on both sides of that one as well. Um, but there, too, we have to ask the question is, if we create a national database, what are the risks that we create for ourselves by doing that? versus the benefits? And if we're not going to do that, how are we going to ensure that um, felons, mentally ill, and so forth, can't buy guns so you have order. So anyway, I think I've used up my five minutes, but hopefully we'll set the parameters for where I'd like to see the big go well, naturally. Great, great. Thanks, Dave. Well, well, Kylie, I think I'm going to bring us back to you on, on the, uh, let's get more specific. I heard a lot of platitudes and um, a lot of agreement, surprisingly. But let's get very specific on what kind of restrictions are reasonable and where we cross that line as to where we're violating civil liberties. So I think maybe I'll just turn that over to you, Kelly. Can you tell me where you think that line is when we have a second amendment violation, especially in the context of recent legislation, uh, particularly with regard to background checks, with regulating uh, and requiring background checks on the sale between close friends, for example? Um, uh, on, on things like uh, limiting the size of magazines uh, and restricting the types of guns that people can have in their own homes. Uh, in, in fact, in the Heller case, there were, I believe there were uh, rules requiring the guns to be disassembled, for example. Are, are you able to sort of put a stick in the ground or draw a line in the sand as to where that should be? Um, well, I, I think that you can certainly argue that uh, certain proposed uh, laws would violate our rights, but I also think that some of the laws that are proposed just are ineffective. And I think if we're going to expend the energy and the political capital to try to do something about the problem we have, we should be using it in a smart way. So for example, the assault weapons ban that we had passed in the 90s and the guy in the side tried to get through again, um, for the most part, doesn't work, doesn't make sense does not have any clear definitions, is mostly based on a, a politically invented term that doesn't have a real meaning. 
Um, the, for the, the current proposed one that, that she had, for example, included in the definition of an assault weapon, all ammunition feeding devices capable of accepting more than 10 rounds. That's a clip that can hold more than 10 bullets. Well, that's not really a weapon unless you're going to use it as a blood instrument to hit somebody over the head with it. So do we really want to say that even, even the accessories that go with these things should not be allowed because that's going to accomplish the greater goal of trying to reduce gun deaths? I don't think so. And when you talk about trying to ban these things, one of the big problems with the assault weapons ban is that it grandfathers in everything that already exists. So manufacturers can't produce new ones, but if you already have a magazine clip at home that can hold more than 10 rounds, how are we going to enforce that? Are we going to go into your home and see what you have in there and take it away from you? Are we going to have mandatory gun buybacks? Are we going to require people to uh, participate in the registry where they have to declare ownership of all of these these magazine clips or the ammunition, which again, are not in themselves actual weapons, assault or otherwise. So I, I think that it's um, sort of incumbent upon the gun control advocates to explain how just that particular definition of an assault weapon, how that even is an assault weapon, and how it makes sense for us and how it's going to be effective in banning that kind of assault weapon according to this proposed bill, uh, how that's going to actually accomplish the task of reducing gun deaths. So Laura, what about the, the argument that gun law, that we ban guns, only criminals have guns, right? That uh, gun laws have not been effective. In fact, on that point, I know that Joe Biden said in the press that he didn't think that assault weapon ban would be effective uh, in reducing the criminal uh, element of, of gun violence. What's your view on it? Well, um, I have several things to say to that. First of all, the, the term assault weapon was invented by the gun industry. So um, as sales of hunting rifles started to decline because people don't hunt as much as they used to, the gun industry decided we need something else to market to people because we need to keep our profits up. And they had the great idea to take combat weapons and, and alter them so that they can only fire semi-automatic instead of in combat where they can switch between fully automatic or semi-automatic. automatic and start marketing these to regular civilians. Um, they came up with the term, a term assault weapon, which they used in their literature to make these more attractive. Um, of course, once people became aware of how dangerous these weapons were and started using the term assault weapon, now the gun industry says there's no such thing as an assault weapon. The problem is you can still see the literature that they put out in the 80s. Um, so an assault weapon is defined differently depending on how the law is written. The federal ban that expired is very different than the one that was just projected in the Senate. California's ban is very different than New Jersey's ban, different than Connecticut's ban. They're all they're all slightly different. But what is this, the key the key parts of any assault weapon ban is looking at the function of the weapon. What makes it different? What makes it suitable for combat versus suitable for hunting? So one of the things, of course, is that it's semi-automatic. When you hunt, um, you generally don't bring a 20-round magazine with you. Um, in fact, a lot of places, there are limits on how many um, bullets you can have. So it's called fair, it's called fair game, or something like that, so that you're not supposed to be, you know, mowing down. How much of down. an advantage do you need over exactly. a deer when you get down to it? Well, and who wants to shoot a deer more than once? You know, like, you don't really want a carcass riddled with bullets. So, so having a semi-automatic weapon that can hold a very large magazine is clearly something that's useful in combat, not useful in hunting. Um, and then the, uh, the things that go into the definition of an assault weapon typically are functions, or they're components of a gun that would allow you to steady the weapon while you're spraying fire. So when you're in combat, you're spraying as much fire as you can as quickly as you can. That produces a lot of recoil, the gun's going all over the place. You need a second pistol grip, so you've got, like this. Um, you're not shooting this from the shoulder, like a rifle, like target shooting. This is something where you're spraying. So, um, so all of the features in, an assault, in a well-written assault weapon ban, such as California's, um, have features like that, features that allow you to steady a weapon while it is spraying large amounts. Uh, so it's not arbitrary in any way. It is, it is very, very well thought out and finely, finely tuned. We worked very closely with Diane Feinstein's office on um, the bill that just failed. And believe me, it was months in the making. Um, and every single word in that bill was thought about and talked about and mulled over. So 
um, it's it's not political at all it, until it gets made political by the other side. Um, large capacity ammunition magazines, of course, they're not weapons, and yet they are arguably more dangerous than assault weapons because they are used much more often than assault weapons. Um, almost, most semi-automatic guns in this country can take a large capacity ammunition magazine, so they get used all the time. Um, so to ban the magazine, actually, I, I think what um, Vice President Biden was saying is that it actually has a greater impact than an assault weapon ban. And I think most people on my side of this movement um, would actually prefer a magazine ban over an assault weapon ban. So let's follow up on that. Or some sort of comment. There's a, a couple of uh, tangled things going on there because a, a lot of ideas jumble into that. One of them is on the um, on the magazine capacity issue. This is something that. There is a pragmatic argument about it as to how effective it will be to outlaw these when anyone with a machine shop can extend a clip pretty easily. Um, that's one of the things that I've heard the gun lobby raise, and it's a fair point. I mean, it's, when you're going to pass a law that is very easily circumvented, you've got to wonder how much good this is going to do. Um, however, um, I seem to remember seeing that most of the mass shootings that we've had have actually been perpetrated by people with extended clips. And while having a smaller clip would not actually have stopped the massacre, it may have been half as many people down there. And to me, that's a fairly significant step forward. In Sandy Hook, for example, I think um, we could have had half as many kids killed as we did. Um, to me, you have to have a fairly compelling argument against that sort of benefit before it's going to really hold water. And the argument in favor of extending clips to me is a little bit thin. I mean, I think the, uh, the gun lobby would argue that we need to have large clips available to citizens because the main enemy we're thinking about is the government. People eventually are going to need weapons as a way to keep the government in check. And if we end up with a tyrannical government, which certainly can happen, it has, can, and will in nearly every society across the planet at one time or another, it's generally true that it's harder to push around an armed population than an unarmed population. You can certainly see what happens in countries that that, um, that the citizenry does have access to weapons. They're, they're not typically as abused in many cases as they are in countries like Tokugawa, Japan, where even sword guns and so forth. Um, I see some truth to that. I'm not sure that high capacity magazines make much of a difference there. I mean, as someone that's participated somewhat in combat si uh, simulations and has, has done a lot of reading about it, um, Realistically, are a couple of guys who don't have a lot of training with, with pistols or rifles, are they going to stand up against a, a brigade of army rangers? It'll be over in a couple of minutes. I mean, it's, it doesn't mean that there isn't some, um, some value to having um, the army really have to think twice before it goes in there and having more deterrence to go in because the citizenry at least have some ability to fight back rather than none. And it is true that guerrilla conflict, which can be fueled by these weapons, um, does make a populace harder to push around, but only to a point. And having slightly larger magazines doesn't seem to have a very dramatic impact on that. So from that point of view, it's hard for me to see a lot of value in continuing to have high magazines. And it is hard for me to read in the Constitution a right to have a 30-round clip as opposed to a 10-round clip, um, which brings me back, back to the practicality. Um, if it would have taken these clips out of the last two mass shootings, there is a value there. Um, if it would have basically just irritated people to the point where they needed to know someone at the machine shop to fix it, not so much. And that's, uh, that, that's without even getting into the question of whether we should be making policy based on the mass shootings that happen periodically, because they are, thank God, aberrational events, and having everybody's rights affected by what happens one time in a blue moon, slightly more often than meteor strikes, um, is another question that's worth talking about, but that could open a whole other dialogue. I think you raise a really interesting question, actually, of you know what do we need these things for, which it, it's a common argument that we hear in this discussion. What do you need a gun for that can fire 15 rounds at once instead of 10? But that's not how our laws function in this country. We don't ban things just because there's no need for them. If that were the case, we also wouldn't have beer in this country. Nobody needs beer. But that's not how our democracy functions. And I don't think that we've really seen that limiting the magazine clips to 10 rounds instead of 18 rounds is really going to make the difference. I've heard of extended fat firefights even in places like Oakland and downtown LA. 
And I could well be wrong about that, but unless that's really the practical risk that people are facing, I think we need to take a little bit with a grain of salt the degradation in your self-defense that you face about having a 10 round clip instead of a 15 round clip. I, I, yeah, is it okay to interject now? Uh, sure. On this topic? sure. Dale, what you're talking about is, that I think, is the concept that one or two shots will take somebody down whether they're a crack addict or not. It's more or less Which, over before you need to change clips in most cases. Yes, that's a fair well, point. Well, you know, it's, and then first of all, it's not accurate, true. particularly yeah. depending upon the uh, caliber of what you're shooting. Uh, Kylie, I don't understand what you're talking about. If somebody comes in and you start loading your magazine, obviously your magazine's going to be preloaded if you're going to have it in your house for self-defense. Oh, right? you better be. You don't want to be loading it when somebody's breaking out. But it's like, <laughs> the classes I've taken, basically, and this is what cops are told, you keep shooting until they're down. And you you know, there are people that, particularly crack, uh, people who are high on crack or whatever, 10 rounds later, they're still coming at you. So I think that that idea... Um, it's only true if you miss. However, that, no, doesn't, not true. that doesn't mean it's not true but because actually true you're if you going to miss most of the time in a, in a battlefield cons condition. I mean, that's one thing that people which, get a bad idea from. Which gets me to what Laura was talking about and, and, uh, as far as this concept of assault weapons. If you're using it in your home for defense, don't you want to have control so things aren't spraying all over? I'm not saying a, an assault sure. weapon is the best thing in your house right. to use for something. I think, but if you, I are, think you do want to have control, but don't most people have other people and who really wants to be spraying more than 10 rounds of bullets around their house? I mean, I would rather the crack dealer come in and steal whatever he's going to steal than threaten, than risk shooting my own children because I'm spraying bullets around my house. Well, well if, you've taken a, if you've taken the appropriate courses that any gun owner should take, you're not spraying anything anywhere. You're shooting those bullets one right after another in exactly the same hole in the same place because that's what the courses teach you. If you're you that do. accurate, you should not need more than 10. If you can spray them exactly in the same hole over and over and over, then 10 is plenty. And there are three, so then and there are three people that come in. what you need. Three and that is not in. how we pass laws and how we regulate things, that you only are allowed to own something if you have a constitutional proof that you need it. Well, this is Actually, I have a question for Dale. Um, one of the arguments that, that I heard you mention, I don't think I've ever heard before against uh, gun control, is, is that uh, it's harder to subdue populace than an unarmed populace. And I'm just wondering, if, is that an argument that is, that is even raised today uh, by like the NRA or other? No, oh, absolutely. It is? I would say it's at the heart of their argument is that the real reason we need guns is to protect ourselves against the government. If we don't have them, it's going to be a lot easier for socialists or Nazis or whoever to come back and round us up and, and put us in camps. Although, I do have to say that while I find that persuasive to a point, the empirical evidence in this country hasn't backed it up. The one time in our history that that happened to people that were American citizens, as distinct from First Nations people and so forth, who weren't, it didn't do jack squat. Um, and that was in the 1940s with the internment of Japanese Americans. Neither they nor any other force within society that was armed rose up to do anything about it. Does that mean the argument has no force? No, it doesn't. I, mean, I, just, have, I just have you know, never heard it made. I mean, I've heard home defense, certainly. You know, maybe even more often than hunting, and, and that's why maybe some of the restrictions where you're, where you're talking about the alternatives are either hunting or not. You know, there's something else which is home defense, but I've never heard defense against your government. At least I haven't heard that. The reason in like you haven't main, heard it, mainline, main, I guess, the mainstream. It's a framed argument, yeah. um, and it was not the core of the Heller decision at all. The Scalia, who is is no liberal. I mean, let's all agree on that. Um, he didn't have based Heller on the insurrectionist right. He based it on the right self-defense. And in that opinion, and I'm sure that if he could have, he would have, um, you know, gone farther. But what, what the Supreme Court has decided and what they had the votes for at this time was a handgun in the home. You have a right to a handgun in your home for self-defense. And, and that's what the Supreme Court has decided and that's what we're dealing with. So to re-argue, you know, Heller, I, I'm not sure that it's really that worthwhile. Well, it goes a little more than that, because it's also reasonable restrictions, as well as having a handgun in your home. And I kind of bring this back to my original question. I've heard lots of reasons, you know, theoretical reasons, why gun laws do or not work with all these restrictions. But why don't we take a look at the evidence when we ask this question? Um, and Dale, you, you alluded, Laura, you alluded to this as well. Uh, some of the, the laws that different states and localities have enacted 
But hasn't it been true that the places with the most restrictive laws still have the highest incidences of gun violence? Uh, for example, and isn't the inverse true? For example, in Florida, where they enacted a right to carry law, since that happened, their murder rate has actually gone down. So is it true that, uh, I mean, is it, is it true that these restrictions on gun laws actually do have a direct effect on gun violence? It is true that they have a direct effect on gun violence. Um, it is also true that in the 90s, the NRA um, was able to get a provision put into the funding um, that goes to the CDC to stop them from any research on this issue. So that's this is the only issue the CDC is not allowed to delve into. Um, they can track gun deaths, but they can't, they can't do effectiveness um, surveys. Um, we rank all of the states on their gun laws, and we, you know, we give them points for every single law and every nuance of every law that they have, and we come up with a list. Um, and you know, it's basically California, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, and these are the states that kind of come out on top. Um, and then we take the CDC gun death rates and we compare it. We just look at it um, on an Excel spreadsheet and see what happens. And the 10 states with the best gun laws are, I think six of them have the lowest gun death rates, are in the 10 lowest gun death rates in the country. Now, we are not um, academics. So we, you know, we haven't done a peer-reviewed study on this, but I mean, just from common sense, it seems like there is some correlation there. There are academics who have studied the issue and, um, at Harvard, and what they have found is that states that have more guns in homes have higher gun death rates. So kind of what you were saying before, the more guns that are around, the more people die. Um, and that's for common sense, too. But um, you still have to factor in that when we're talking about gun deaths in this country and you're not separating out how those happen, the majority of gun deaths in this country are self-inflicted. And, and so, why is that not important? That well, I'm not saying that it's not important, but when you're talking about wanting to limit ammunition and magazine capacity, that really doesn't have any effect on the person who dies from one shot. No, there's and no that's the majority of gun deaths we're talking about. Of course, about. And, and of course there's not only one law that's going to solve all the problems in this very complicated issue. Um, the, the way that you approach the issue of suicide, I mean, from a personal point of view, you just don't have a gun in your home because you're much more likely to have someone in your home use it against themselves. But if you are going to have a gun in the home, the, the, what you would do as a, as a government is you would require it be locked. Um, you would require that it be stored unless it's on the person, because you have to have, um, under Heller, you have to have an exception for self-defense. So if it's out of your control and if it's not on your person, um, it should be locked, it should be unloaded. Um, there should be, you should make sure your child can't get it. I think further to what uh, Roger was saying, um, I'm not sure that the evidence out there is as complete as we would like it to be. I mean, I've, had, I've done some Googling on this, I've had some discussions with folks that know much more than I do about it, and Unfortunately, it's difficult to tell, I think, in some cases, exactly what the trends really are. For example, we, we just had an example. We, we just had a, a point here about houses with more guns have more gun deaths. And yet, we also see that not a lot of these studies are normalized for. Are you really checking it whether there are more accidental gun deaths versus use of guns to defend a home or in a crime? Because you're not normalizing in many of these studies for rural areas, for high crime areas, or so forth. Um, I have never been able to find, and I've been looking for it, data to see how often a gun is used to deter, to, to, uh, deter a crime versus to commit it. I mean, there is, there is the, the, the paradigm that the NRA usually likes to cite, and I think that animated some of the Heller decision is the notion that if somebody breaks into your home and you have a gun, you can, you can drive them off. Or if you have a gun with you and you're attacked, you can use it to defend yourself. I don't know exactly how often that happens relative to time that your gun actually gets used either against you or that a gun gets used by a bad guy to commit a crime. Um, the cops that I've spoken to don't seem to think that it's very common at all that people actually use weapons to defend themselves very effectively, that it seems to be that they're much more likely to be used for bad purposes than for good ones. Um, and I'm not sure how to collect that information. I've seen a lot of anecdotes from both sides. 2010, there were only 230 justifiable homicides involving a private citizen using a firearm, and that same year there were 8,275 criminal gun homicides. That, that does say something. Um, there are also issues that we need to go into in terms of the, the gun rates. I have looked at those, and I think what you said is true, that after the concealed carry um, was passed, the, uh, the, the uh, violent death rate in Florida fell. 
It's also true that the violent death rate in the entire country fell during the same period. And it actually fell more during the assault weapons ban than it did just during the period you see right after the concealed carry uh, was passed in Florida. It's not clear to me, um, and I'm far from an expert in this area, that either one of those declines was actually attributable to the loss. Um, during the same period, the economy got an awful lot better. You had a lot more people that were no longer so desperate. And um, that is historically correlated with drops in violence. But I don't know if anyone has really been able to draw causal links here. I mean, I think we've, we have a situation where often people pass tough gun laws because they're in an area where they have a lot of crime, and that's why they pass them. Um, I think you also have situations where um, you started off with a high gun rate, you don't know exactly what would have happened with or without the, uh, the restrictions. And that works both ways. I think concealed carry, at least in the abstract, seems like it could be something that could be a deterrent if you live in a high crime area. And the, the bad guys don't know if you're armed, you might be in better shape than if they know you're not armed. Um, but I don't know whether, whether there really has been a causal link made there. I don't know, maybe one of you can, can speak better to that than I can. There's no evidence that I've ever seen that proves that lacks concealed carry laws because all 40, 49 of the 50 states have allowed concealed carry, including California. Um, but the difference is between lax laws like Florida's law and California's law, which is more stringent. Um, and that the gun lobby, which loves to talk about concealed carry and self-defense and all this, has never come up with a credible study showing that it has any impact on crime. So, and the I study from would, the other side showing that it does. We don't does have that answer. No. And look at and if the CDC were allowed to study it, maybe we'd have a definitive answer. But we don't. I mean, I think a lot of these laws and a lot of the proposals are speculation that are generally proposed after a high-profile, very tragic story has happened in the news. People are very panicked, they're very scared, they want to make sure it never happens again, and they think, well, if we ban that kind of gun that was used in that crime, or that kind of ammunition that was used in that crime, then we won't have those kinds of crimes anymore. And I think that's an understandable human reaction, but it's like trying to add terrorism by banning box cutters. I mean, that, that's not the source of the problem. Now, we can make them harder to obtain, and we can make all kinds of restrictions and requirements that say that in order to purchase them or possess them, you have to jump through certain hoops. But I don't think that responding by just wanting to ban things, which is generally the gun control approach, is really necessarily the best approach. When we're talking about almost 200 million guns in this country, 40% of American households own guns. They're not all criminals. They're not all potential criminals. And so how we're treating the 40% of American households that already own guns, and the attitude that we have that they're a bunch of gun nuts and the gun lobby and the NRA, which only has three or four million members anyway, it's just not as big and powerful as people imagine that it is. I don't think that that leads to a productive dialogue with all of those law-abiding, responsible American citizens who also own guns and believe in exercising their Second Amendment rights. Well, I, I was going to agree with just about all of that, except for the uh, lack of power of the NRA. They did just manage to kill something that had roughly 90% public support. But that said, um, I think you're exactly right that legislating to make it feel like we did something about a high-profile event is not a way to make policy that's responsible. And I think that's one of the problems with the Sandy Hook issue, that the, the, uh, the legislation that's on the table now would not have stopped it. No. And that is problematic. I mean, if, if you look at it as being justified as we want to keep our children safe, and you look at it and you see none of the proposals on the table actually would have prevented it, that means that's not a legitimate basis for passing those laws. However, that doesn't mean the laws themselves are a bad idea. A background check might not have stopped that. It may well have stopped many other problems. I mean, and each one of these things needs to be analyzed as a background check. And, and the, actually the NRA is the, the initial source of that proposal, I think, about a decade ago. Um, right. and it's, so we're getting to the top of the hour. I'd like to give everybody an opportunity to sum up. So I'll have two minutes of, from each of you. And, uh, Kylie, we started with you, Larissa, and Laurel, we'll start with you. Um, I, I guess I would wrap up by saying that there's been a lot of Constitutional questions have already been answered, and in some way that helps us in this debate because we know what the parameters of this right are, at least in its most basic um, core. And so we know that everyone has the right now to a gun in the home. 
Um, and the question is, as you have said, where are the reasonable regulations on that right? And the courts that, you know, of course this, um, this the Heller decision opened up a flood of litigation across the country. And the courts have almost unanimously found that um, the Second Amendment is limited to a right in the home. It has not been extended to carrying a gun on the street. Um, it has not been extended to um, assault weapons, whether you can ban assault weapons or not. Um, it's, it is limited, and and every almost every other reasonable regulation has already been upheld um, on, at some circuit or some district court somewhere. And it's likely this will come back up to the Supreme Court because they left a lot open. Um, and we'll see what happens. But the way that we're seeing litigation right now, it seems to be um, that there's still a lot of room to do a lot of good things to really work on this problem. Um, well, I, I think that uh, it seems to be pretty clear that there is a constitutional right here that is at issue, um, that um, we have considerably more space than we have used to have reasonable regulations. Um, I would just, again, put in a plea to make sure that the national debate focus on what works and thinks pragmatically about what is actually happening day to day when people use guns, um, what in what ways should they be used, in what ways can they properly be used consistent with that right, and what kind of controls can we be thinking about that actually make the situation better rather than worse. I, I do urge that people focus on, um, they, they start from the standpoint of regulation is generally not something you want to do unless there's a pretty good reason, uh, but in this case I think we see some pretty good reasons that we should be doing more than we are. It does seem to me that it doesn't we, we don't have to have completely unrestricted access consistent with the Constitution and that we can do better than we are doing. Um, but we need to be sure that anything that we pass is actually going to move the ball forward and not be simply a measure to make it sound like we're doing something about a crisis that might not actually have any effect other than a burden on the constitutional right. Well, I agree with a lot of what Dale said. I think that Almost everybody in this country, including gun owners, even including members of the NRA, the most extremist groups there are, support having certain kinds of regulations. And those are the kinds of regulations that we need to be fighting for. Whether they can get through in the Senate, well, that's because we have a broken Senate and we need filibuster reform, but that's a topic for another day. Um, but I think that we need to focus on working with people who are supporters of the Second Amendment to find restrictions that work that are effective, that are not based on you know, panic fear in response to a high profile tragedy, but on things that are actually going to work and I think that we'll get support from even gun owners and supporters of the Second Amendment. And I think there are a lot of things out there that we can do that they, we, I, will support. Demonizing gun owners and demonizing supporters of the Second Amendment and saying we're going to ban everything that you own, I don't think that's going to work. I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, this lively discussion on gun control legislation. And at this point, we'll go ahead and conclude the discussion.